So let me, uh, I'll introduce you. Yeah. Hi everybody. So my name is Patty. I'm one of the horticulturists with Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Ocean County. I'm here with uh, our senior horticulturist, Sue Servideo. Um, she's usually the one who's doing the announcing, but she's, her voice is going. So here we are. Um, so tonight I'm really excited to have Emily Fontaine from the Center of Vector Biology. She's the project coordinator for NJ Ticks for Science, um, which is a program we're trying to interact with at our uh, office because we do tick ID there. And hopefully um, this information will be really valuable for the residents all over New Jersey. It's very exciting. And Dina Fonseca, who is the um, director for the Center of Vector Biology is here also. Um, so Emily, take it away. All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, as I was just introduced, I'm, I did prepare like a little introduction for myself. So my name is Emily Fontaine. I work at Rutgers University in the Center for Vector Biology as the project coordinator for NJ Ticks for Science. And today I'm gonna be talking about some uh, tick confidence tips uh, so that you can become more tick confident uh, with our uh, citizen science project NJ ticks for science. So, why is it important to become tick confident and learn about ticks and tick borne diseases? Well, here uh, in the Northeast, especially in New Jersey, ticks are a gigantic problem. So, if you look at this map here, this map represents uh, Lyme disease cases by state of residence in the year of 2021. The green on this map represents uh, Lyme disease cases reported. And if you look at New Jersey, New Jersey is completely green. And so this means that in literally every place in New Jersey, a Lyme disease case was reported. And actually in 2021, New Jersey was the highest reporter out of the entire United States uh, for Lyme disease cases with a total of 3,518 cases reported. And then in 2022, that number rose to nearly 6,000 cases. And what's interesting about this is that we are one of the highest reporters of Lyme disease in the whole United States, but these numbers are only representative of about one tenth of the actual cases, and that's because most cases go unreported. So these should actually be 10 times the numbers that they currently are. Uh, so Lyme disease is obviously a very big problem, but if you're going to take one thing from this talk, uh, it's that there's more than just Lyme disease. So this graph here shows uh, different tick-borne diseases that are present here in New Jersey, uh, including ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, spotted fever, rickettsiosis, and babesiosis. And this graph here uh, shows how these tick-borne diseases, uh, the number of case reports in humans throughout the years, so from 2001 to 2022. And so it has fluctuated over the years. Uh, however, you can really notice that from 2001 now uh, to 2022, uh, representing, it's not 2024, but closest to where we are now, uh, these numbers have drastically increased. So Lyme disease is something that should be on our radar, but these other tick-borne disease, diseases should also be on our radar uh, because they are, very prevalent here, um, but they are lesser known. So if you leave here today with one piece of information, know that there is more than just Lyme disease and ticks can be co-infected with multiple pathogens that can lead to uh, multiple tick-borne diseases. So this isn't to worry you. And you're probably like, Emily, this talk is literally supposed to make me feel more confident when I'm dealing with ticks. Why are you telling me that there are so many other things I should be worrying about? There's so many other tick-borne diseases other than just Lyme. Well, I'm not trying to worry you. Uh, the more information you have, the better conversations you can have with your doctor, uh, the better you can advocate for you, your children, your friends, and your family uh, if they ever encounter a tick bite. Knowledge is power, uh, and the more knowledge you have about ticks, the more confident you're gonna feel the next time you encounter one or if you get a tick bite. So let's stop with the worrying. We'll put the worrying on hold, and let's just start with the basics. What are ticks? So ticks, a lot of the time people tell me are they're the worst insects, I hate those insects, but actually ticks are not insects at all. So, our fly friend here in the web, 
Uh, this fly is an insect, and we know it's an insect because it has three segmented body parts and six legs. However, our tick friend over here does not have three segmented body parts, and it does not have six legs. It has eight legs. And what else has eight legs? Our spider friend over here. So ticks are actually classified as arachnids. They are not insects. So now that we know what a tick is, let's talk about their life cycle. So ticks start out as eggs, then they become larvae, then they reach their nymphal stage, and finally they'll reach adulthood. And in order to get from one stage to the next, they need a blood meal. So for this larva to become a nymph, this larva needs to have a blood meal. Once it has its blood meal, it'll molt and become a nymph. For this nymph to become an adult, it needs a blood meal. Once it has it, it can molt and become an adult. Then this adult, this is a female adult, in order for it to reproduce, uh, it needs a big blood meal. Uh, and this blood meal, just like the other blood meals, will provide it with nutrients and energy. And since it's a very large blood meal, it's going to provide it with lots of nutrients and energy that it needs in order to uh, reproduce. So that's the different stages that they go through, but how do ticks take up and pass pathogens from one organism to another. So this happens during their blood meals. So let's start with this example. Let's start with this larval black-legged deer tick. This is an uninfected larval black-legged deer tick. And in order to become a nymph, it needs a blood meal. So it's gonna take its first blood meal from this uninfected white-footed mouse. So this mouse doesn't have uh, any pathogens in its blood. It's uninfected, completely clean. Since this larval tick now has had its blood meal, it's able to molt and become a nymphal tick. This nymphal tick now needs to become an adult. In order to do so, it needs a blood meal. But now this blood meal, even though this tick is currently uninfected because it had a uh, blood meal from an uninfected uh, white-footed mouse, this tick needs another blood meal in order to become an adult. But this time it's gonna take a blood meal from an infected white-footed mouse. And it's infected with uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is also known as Lyme bacteria. So when it takes this blood meal, it's going to take up the Lyme bacteria. Now it's had its blood meal, it can molt, and it can become an adult tick. However, this adult tick is now infected with Lyme bacteria. And now this female black-legged deer tick needs another blood meal in order to reproduce. So this next blood meal, unfortunately, is going to come from a human. And if this black-legged deer tick that's infected with Lyme bacteria stays on this human for more than 24 hours, then it will be able to pass that uh, to him and then uh, which can lead to Lyme disease. So that is how tick-borne diseases are spread. So we talked about the life cycle of ticks uh, and the different stages that they go through, but I didn't really talk about the different sizes of them. And I wanted to talk about this because it's really important to note the size of ticks because that's a lot of the time how um, tick-borne disease goes undiscovered is because you don't even notice that you had a tick on you. You didn't even realize that a tick bit you because ticks are so, so small. And they're smaller than we realize. Before I started working with ticks, I really had no idea how small ticks could be. So in New Jersey fashion, I decided to create um, this uh, figure here that shows ticks on a bagel, um, which you can see a tick here, but you might not be able to see all of the ticks on this bagel. And that's because ticks can be really, really small. So nymphal ticks are about the same size as a poppy seed. So this poppy seed right here is about the same size as this nymphal tick. Then adult ticks are about the same size as a sesame seed. And then larval ticks, you'll notice I didn't even include on this uh, image here because they are so small. They're even smaller than a poppy seed. So it would be kind of impossible to see them on this bagel at all. So remember that adult ticks are the size of a sesame seed like this. Nymphal ticks are the size of a poppy seed. 
And then larval ticks are smaller than a poppy seed. So ticks can be really, really small. And it's important to know this the next time you're doing a tick check, because now you'll have a better idea of what you could be looking for. So if you notice like a weird skin tag or a scab or whatever, a lot of the time that's what I hear from people. And they're like, I didn't know it was a tick. If you feel something different, um, totally give it a double check uh, because you never know. Um, and this is another reason why uh, it's important to do tick checks uh, and be really thorough. And this is because tick season is every season. So this figure here, there's a lot going on, but the main point of this that I want you to take away from it is that ticks are active all year long, no matter what time of year it is. And you might say, but Emily, this doesn't go uh, this doesn't include December, January, and February, and if you notice that, very good eyes, but I'm here to tell you that black-legged deer ticks uh, during the months of December, January, and February, they are still active out looking for hosts, adult black-legged deer ticks are, um, as long as it's above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, they'll be out looking for hosts. So. Tick season is every season. Make sure that when you're doing a tick check, you're looking for even really tiny things and that you're doing a tick check even when it's the fall and winter. Most of the time I hear people say, oh, I don't have to worry about ticks because they're only around in the summer and in the spring, but that is not true at all. Black-legged deer tick adults are active during the fall and winter months. And these ticks, the black-legged deer ticks are the ones uh, that can carry Lyme, Babesia, Anaplasma. Uh, they're also linked to encephalitis. So these ticks uh, can be carrying many pathogens at once. And out of the ticks in New Jersey, out of these four, I would have to say uh, this one is carrying like the most pathogens, like Lyme and Babesia. Like you don't, you want to avoid this tick. Um, because it's more likely to be carrying things that can lead to disease. So that is a big takeaway. Tick season is every season. And just because on the previous slide, I only talked about four ticks, I wanted to explain why I only talked about those four. And that's because these are the four main ticks of New Jersey that are going to bother us or our pets. So, uh, Black-legged deer tick, the lone star tick, American dog tick, and Asian longhorn tick are all ticks that we might encounter or our pets might encounter. These other ticks that I have listed here are more like species-specific ticks, uh, but these ones we will most likely encounter. However, I also wanted to give a special shout out to the brown dog tick. Uh, this tick does bite humans, but it's less prevalent than it was uh, 80 years ago, 80 years ago, this was the most common tick species found in New Jersey. Uh, then also, I wanted to give a special shout out to the Gulf Coast tick. So this tick is not officially recognized as a tick of New Jersey. However, um, it is typically found in the southern United States, but it was recently found here in New Jersey. Uh, and I was even sent a Gulf Coast tick as a part of um, the NJ Ticks for Science project. I'll talk more about that later, but I was sent a Gulf Coast tick. So these ticks are an expansive species. So they're moving upwards from the Southern United States to New Jersey. And it's not top five ticks now, but it could be in the future. So uh, keep your eye out for the Gulf Coast tick. And in a little bit, I'm gonna talk about uh, ways in which you can identify these four different uh, species of ticks, the four main species of ticks uh, in New Jersey. And before I do that, I wanted to all have like a baseline of terminology, of tick terminology. So I wanted to go over some basic tick anatomy. So here I have two ticks. I have the lone star tick and I have the black-legged deer tick. These are both females. And the first piece of anatomy I wanted to point out is the mouth parts. A lot of the time people will say that this is the head of the tick. Make sure to get the head out. Or like people say things like that. But ticks actually don't have heads at all. Ticks just have mouth parts. So if you ever hear someone say that, you'd be like, actually it's the mouth parts. Or if you don't wanna be that person, you could just totally keep it inside and just know that you're right in your heart. But 
the other piece of anatomy I wanted to highlight is the sputum. And the sputum is this hard, like, outer shell on the uh, tick. It's like a hard outer layer. Um, and sputums can come in different shapes and sizes. This is this one over here is more round, um, and they also come in different colors, but they're this kind of like harder outer shield uh, on the tick. And on female ticks, they only go about halfway up or a little less than halfway up the back of the tick. Um, then finally, the last piece of anatomy I wanted to point out are the festoons, or in this case over here, the lack of festoons. So festoons are just like bumpy ridges on the back uh, bottom of the tick. So here, the lone star tick, you see these bumpy ridges here. Those are festoons. Here, it's all smooth. There's no bumpy ridges. So there are no festoons. And just keep in mind that during this whole talk, the black-legged deer tick is the only tick that we will be talking about today that does not have festoons. So just keep that in mind. Black-legged deer tick, only one that does not have festoons because we'll return to it later. Uh, so I showed in the previous slide some basic tick anatomy uh, for female ticks. Now I'm going to address how female ticks and male ticks differ. So female ticks have a sputum, that hard outer shield, that goes only about halfway up their uh, backs. So you see here it's like halfway. Here it's a little less than halfway, but you can clearly see uh, a divide between the sputum and the rest of their body. And so the sputum on females only goes about halfway, but on males, it goes all the way down their back. So it's as if this part, this sputum right here was just dragged all the way down the back of the tick. Then here, the same thing happens. So you see this like white milky camouflage pattern here, on the female, but it doesn't continue down. Uh, it's only about halfway, but for the male, it goes all the way down the back. So the sputum goes all the way down uh, to the bottom where their festoons are. So this just shows um, the difference between sputums in males and females. So just remember males, it goes all the way down, whereas females, it goes about halfway. But why is this? Before I kind of gave a hint as to why, um, before I mentioned how female ticks need a big, big blood meal in order to get enough energy and nutrients uh, to produce eggs. So this, the sputum, if you notice here, the sputum hasn't changed at all. Uh, and that's because the sputum's like this hard outer shell. And so it's not gonna budge. But then the rest of the tick, the reason why female ticks aren't, their backs aren't fully covered in sputums is because they need uh, to be able to expand. They need to be able to get a lot of blood. And with a sputum that goes all the way down their back, they wouldn't be able to do that. With the sputum that goes halfway, they can. So this gives them the space they need in order to get all the blood they need to produce all the eggs. Uh, so that is why sputums only go about halfway in females. So now that I've covered that, my question to you is, based on what we know, which one is the female tick? And if you don't want to contribute uh, or like answer the question, no pressure at all. This is very, very low stakes. Really no stakes. All right. So I see people are answering the poll. Yeah, a lot of people, most people are putting uh, the correct answer and I'll give it like one more second so we can get some more answers in. Okay, yeah, everybody is mostly clicking the right answer. So uh, the correct answer is the uh, tick on the left. And the reason for this is because the sputum goes about halfway. And for female uh, lone star ticks, we know that this is a lone star tick, especially because it has this lone star. So this is another thing to remember. Uh, female lone star ticks always have this yellow star on their back. This is a male lone star tick. It doesn't have the star. And you might be like, well, how would I identify a male lone star tick? if it doesn't have the star. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but this sputum 
it gives room uh, for the tick to expand. So this hard outer shell uh, only goes about halfway, so it gives room for more blood. Uh, then again, uh, I'm just reiterating the four main tick species before we get into the tick ID methods. Uh, but the reason why it's important to even be able to understand and differentiate between the four different tick species, the four main ones uh, that we care about is the reason why it's important is because if you know the species of tick that bit you, you can figure out which tick-borne disease um, you might be exposed to. So black-legged deer ticks, they are linked to Lyme disease, if we look at this key here that I made. And this is, if you heard me before, this might be one of the pages that you want to screenshot, because uh, this key is pretty useful if you want to know uh, which diseases are linked to which ticks. So the black-legged deer tick is linked to Lyme disease, which most of you have probably heard about. But it's also associated with anaplasmosis, babesiosis, encephalitis, and relapsing fever. And then it's also always being investigated because science is changing and uh, who knows, maybe a new pathogen, it could carry a new pathogen and be able to transmit it. Uh, we're always looking into things, but these other diseases that are listed are things that have already been researched and shown uh, to be linked to the black-legged deer tick. Then the lone star tick, uh, this species is linked to ehrlichiosis, red meat allergy, and spotted fever. You've probably heard about red meat allergy in the news, uh, and this is actually something that is not a pathogen. So uh, red meat allergy is not caused by a bacteria or a virus or a protozoa. Um, it is something that is inherent in the tick. So uh, red meat allergy, for those who get it, they were bit by a lone star tick, and just in the saliva of all lone star ticks is a sugar molecule that some people's immune systems react poorly to, and it results in red meat allergy. So some people ask me, can you test this tick for red meat allergy? The answer is actually no, because all lone star ticks will have that sugar molecule in their saliva. It just depends on how your immune system reacts to it. And then for the um, American dog tick and Asian longhorn tick, here in New Jersey, they have not been shown to carry pathogens that lead to uh, disease. So this isn't saying that in other parts of the world, the Asian longhorn tick and American dog tick can't be carrying things um, linked to tick-borne disease, but here in New Jersey, research has shown that they're not. So, but we're always investigating, which is why there is a magnifying glass there showing that it's under investigation. Uh, some basic rules before we get into it. Uh, when we're IDing ticks, we don't go by color and we don't go by size. And the reason for this is because if we went by color, we would think these two ticks are the same species. When in reality, they are two different species completely. And if we went by color, we'd probably think that this tick here and this tick here are two different species. However, these two ticks are the same species. This tick is just engorged. Uh, and then this is an unengorged female American dog tick. So we don't go by color. Another thing is we don't go by size. So if we went by size, we'd probably think that this tick here and this tick here were the same species, but um, we don't go by size. And a reason for that is because if you look here, this tick and this tick are actually the same species, but they look different uh, and they look like they could be different species, but it's really just because this is um, a different stage for the different species or a different stage in the same species of tick. So we don't go by color and we don't go by size. This is just an overview of the four main tick species of New Jersey in their female, male, and nymphal stages. One thing that I wanted to point out is that Asian longhorn ticks, uh, there are no males here in uh, New Jersey because uh, Asian longhorn ticks are parthenogenic, which means that they reproduce asexually, so they clone themselves. So there are no male Asian longhorn ticks here, uh, just females. So how we identify lone star ticks. Before, remember I said that for female lone star ticks, they always have the signature star, the lone star uh, at the bottom of their sputum. So that's 
one way that you can remember how to identify a Lone Star Tick. However, that only will work for females. Um, what we're going to do in order to identify male and female Lone Star Ticks, one thing that I like to do is look at their mouth parts. So for Lone Star Ticks, their mouth parts stay the same whether they are males or females. So their mouth parts are long and skinny whether they are a male or a female. So that's one way in which I would identify a Lone Star Tick. So if you look at these mouth parts here, um, they are very long and skinny compared to the Asian Longhorn Tick. These are very short and compact. Another way that you can identify a Lone Star Tick female is through their sputum. So obviously through the star on their back, you can tell, but say they didn't have the star. Uh, then you could use the shape of their sputum. Their sputum is usually kind of like triangular shaped, but I like to think of it kind of like a diamond, like a ring pop. Like imagine like a ring down here kind of is giving a ring pop shape to it. Uh, but I always look for the star as well. Like I do multiple checks to make sure that this is the correct species of tick. So telling males and females apart, uh, you need to remember that they have long skinny mouth parts, uh, but also males, they don't have the signature star, but they do have iridescent um, kind of like horseshoe like markings that are typically near their festoons down here. So they don't have a star, but they are unique and star like in their own way. They do have some markings that you can look at to tell that it's a lone star. Then for the Asian longhorn tick, there's no male species here in New Jersey. So we're only focused on identifying the females. So the female sputum, because it doesn't go all the way down its back, even though it looks like it, uh, because it's very, uh, like the colors are hard to tell apart. It's hard to see that there is a uh, sputum here that doesn't go all the way down the back, but I promise it doesn't and it's circular. Uh, and then there, Mouth parts are short and compact. And then here I have a picture of a samurai because we like to say that the mouth parts of an Asian longhorn tick look like a samurai helmet. Uh, this bump kind of lines up with this over here, and this ridge kind of lines up with that over there. So Asian longhorn tick mouth parts kind of look like a samurai helmet. Uh, then the black legged deer tick, how we can identify those is again through their mouth parts and their sputum. But one thing that I want to know is that their sputum is circular, just like the Asian longhorn tick. But we know this isn't the Asian longhorn tick because the mouth parts are different. They're very different. They're long and they're thick. So the Lone Star tick's mouth parts were long and skinny. These are pretty skinny uh, palps that we got right there. Then these palps are thicker. They're long, but they are thicker. But when I went through the Lone Star Tick, I said, we can identify Lone Star Ticks, male or female, because they have the same mouth parts no matter what sex they are. But when we're looking at the Black-Legged Deer Tick, that's not the same, that's not the case. Um, because we can see here that the mouth parts look very different. But we're not really as concerned about the male Black-Legged Deer Tick because, fun fact, they do not blood feed. So, we're not really interested in learning how to ID them as much because they're not interested in us. So we're equally as uninterested in them. So what we really wanna focus on is identifying female black-legged deer ticks. So we wanna remember that they have circular sputums, but their mouth parts are long and thick. Then for the American dog tick, their mouth parts are short and compact. Uh, and they have kind of this signature sputum of a white milky camouflage pattern. Uh, and then for the males, that white milky camouflage pattern follows all the way down their back. This right here, don't confuse this as a sputum. This is not a sputum. It kind of trips you up. And I use this picture as an example of something that could trip you up if you are identifying a tick. If you see this pattern, um, go all the way down the back, like the sputum falls all the way down, what it looks like here falls all the way down, and what it looks like here falls all the way down the back of the tick, then it's a male tick. Um, so this area here almost looks like a sputum, but this camouflage pattern is going down the whole back of the tick, so I know that it's a male. 
Uh, and also females have this kind of um, eight-sided sputum. It's not round like this because this isn't even a sputum. Don't get mixed up with that. But this is like an eight-sided sputum on the female American dog tick. So if we count, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So they have short and compact mouth parts. They have a white milky camouflage pattern on their sputum. And then they also have um, the short and compact mouth parts. Another way that we ID ticks is through their festoons or lack of festoons. So Lone Star ticks, males and females have festoons. They look a little bit different, but remember festoons are just bumpy ridges at the bottom of the back of the tick. So if you see bumpy ridges, those are festoons. No matter uh, really if they look different, uh, I always just classify any bumpy ridge as a festoon. So the ones that don't have festoons, the only tick species that don't have festoons are the black-legged deer tick. So we saw here, bumpy ridges, Asian longhorn ticks have festoons, lone star ticks have festoons, American dog ticks have festoons, both males and females. The only tick species that we're talking about uh, that doesn't have festoons is the black-legged deer tick. So in summary, how you ID uh, these four main tick species is through their mouth parts, sputum, and festoons. And the black-legged deer tick has long mouth parts that are thick. Their sputum is round and they don't have festoons. Lone star ticks have long skinny mouth parts. Their sputum is diamond-like or like triangular shaped. Uh, and they do have festoons. American dog ticks have short and compact mouth parts. Their sputums, um, when they're females, have like eight sides, and they do have festoons, males and females. Asian longhorn ticks, similar to the American dog ticks, have short and compact mouth parts. Uh, their sputum is round, and they do have festoons. But we know that this isn't the American dog tick because even though they have short and compact mouth parts, their sputum looks very different. So based on what we just went over, some basic tick ID, I have a question, which is, which is the female black-legged deer tick in this image? So is it one, two, or three? And if you don't know, that is totally okay. The whole reason why we're doing this is to learn. Um, and honestly, if I ever mess up on things, I usually remember uh, the answer to those better because I'm like, oh, I don't want to mess up on that next time. But this is very, very low stakes. All right. So it looks like we're getting a lot of answers in and the majority of you are doing phenomenal. I don't even know why I'm here teaching this. Everyone is, wow. Okay. So the answers to the poll, uh, most everyone got it right. Uh, the correct answer is number three. So we know that this is the female black-legged deer tick uh, for a few reasons. So we know it's female because we saw that this sputum goes about halfway. There's space for it to get really engorged. Uh, then we know that it's a black-legged deer tick because it has long, thick mouth parts. Uh, and then also its sputum is circular. And we know that it's not this one because the sputum goes all the way down the back. So we know uh, that this is a black-legged deer tick, but it's a male. This is a Lone Star Tick male. Uh, and then over here, we have an American Dog Tick male. So if you chose three, you were correct. And if you didn't choose three, don't worry about it. This is a uh, all about learning here. All right. Oh, let's see why my slides aren't loading. Hmm. Can anyone see my slides? No, it just disappeared. Now we just see white. Oh, okay, they're back. They're back. Wait. Yep. What happened? Yep. I don't know where my. I'm sorry. Not sure what's happening. Uh, you were right. right there. Yeah. I don't know. You again? can see it here, and it's like telling me there's nothing there. Okay. Um... Oh, okay. <laughs> Technical difficulty. There you go. You so, made it. All right. Uh, so now that we've learned some tick ID um, and we 
know how to identify a tick if we encounter it. Even if you don't know how to identify a tick, if you encounter one, you can always email us or send it to us and I'll talk about our program in a little bit. Uh, but now let's talk about some ways in which you can prevent tick bites and one way of doing that is through habitat modification. So some habitats uh, that you'll commonly find ticks in uh, are meadows, playgrounds, and leaf litter. So what you can do in order to uh, modify these habitats to make ticks less likely to be there uh, is you can mow the grass. You can uh, get rid of the extra shrubs and leaves and you can just really make it so ticks are not going to be able to survive there. So ticks, they need uh, humidity, they need moisture, and they really are, uh, they can't survive in dry temp or dry climates. So removing the grass uh, and removing the shrubs and removing the leaves is removing this uh, moisture for them. It's making the area more dehydrated so they can't survive. But another thing that this is doing is that it's removing the habitats for their hosts that they like to feed on. So mice like to live in tall grass and shrubs and leaves and things like that. So by getting rid of these areas, you're also getting rid of the areas that their hosts like to be in uh, and you're making it more dry so that ticks can't survive in those areas. So all of these are great ways to reduce your risk of getting a tick bite. Uh, so by doing these things, you can uh, clear the area and make it less likely that ticks will uh, be in these habitats. So doing things like mowing grass, raking leaves, and adding mulch or sand uh, to playground areas are great ways that you can modify your habitats to reduce tick bites. Another thing that you can do uh, that is talked about uh, is thinning forests. This sounds really scary when you talk about thinning forests for a tick control method, but what we mean by this is these pictures, hopefully the aerial views of them look less dramatic um, than what you would think when you hear thinning a forest. So here, this is the unthinned forest. Over here, you see the thinned forest. And what this does is it just reduces the amount of areas. Uh, well, it's doing, it's removing the hosts uh, that ticks like to feed on, and then it's also making it drier so that it's harder for ticks to survive. So just like what we talked about in the previous slide, but this is something more uh, a community would decide on rather than, you know, these are more things that you could do in your own backyard. Uh, and this is something that maybe community members would talk about uh, to reduce tick populations as a whole. And then ways in which you can protect yourself on your person uh, from getting tick bites. You can wear uh, the correct clothing. So Good examples are wearing light colored clothes. It makes it easier to spot ticks. Then another thing that you can do is you can tuck your pants into your socks and then tuck your shirt into your pants. And what this does is it reduces the amount of area uh, that ticks have, like the skin access that they have. The sooner they find your skin, the sooner they're going to find a spot to bite. And the sooner they bite, uh, the more likely it is that if they're carrying something that they could pass it to you. So tucking in your pants and tucking in your shirt can be great ways to avoid tick bites. Other things uh, like applying a repellent uh, are good methods to avoid tick bites. Also, probably the best thing that you can do is a tick check after you get back from uh, the park or taking your dog for a walk, being out in your garden. Do a tick check and check everywhere. People have told me anywhere and everywhere they've gotten a tick bite and ticks do not discriminate. They are not shy. Um, so check anywhere and everywhere, uh, especially behind the ears and the knees. Uh, maybe even get someone to check your head or your back for you if you can't see those areas that well yourself. Because uh, remember, ticks can be very, very small. So these are good ways that you can prevent tick bites. Uh, another thing, this is not to size. Uh, don't worry, we don't have ticks that are this big here in New Jersey. Um, but they can get really engorged and pretty big that way. But don't let this scare you. Um, this is just how you remove ticks. You get as close as you can to the mouth parts as possible, and then you pull 
outwards, like straight in a straight motion. Uh, and you want to be gentle. And there's like a lot of misconceptions that people have with removing ticks. Uh, people say that if you don't get the head, which we know it's not the head, it's actually just the mouth parts. Uh, people think that if the head or the mouth parts get left in that a tick could continue to transmit pathogens. That's actually not the case uh, because ticks, their inner workings are very complex. They have a system of valves and uh, ticks are actually very cool, but ticks can't transmit pathogens without their bodies because their main salivary glands are in the body. They're not in the mouth parts. So if the mouth parts get left in, that's okay. They'll just come out like a splinter would. Uh, it can't, con can't continue to transmit anything if it doesn't have its body attached to it. So if that's ever caused you anxiety, hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better. Uh, and what you can do to remove ticks is you can use tweezers, you could use a tw tick remover, or in worst case scenario, use your fingers. Uh, there have been a lot of things that I've seen online of people saying never remove a tick with your fingers. If you press it, then it'll regurgitate its contents into you. Like I said, ticks are very complex uh, on the inside and they have a system of valves. Uh, so if you squeeze them, it's not going to regurgitate its contents back into you. Uh, you don't want to pop a tick if it's really engorged because that would be gross. But what you want to do is if you don't have tweezers or a tick remover available and you notice you have a tick on you is remove it as soon as possible. Because if it's carrying something, then the longer it stays on you, the more likely that it's going to pass it to you. So remove those ticks ASAP, whether you have tweezers or not. Don't wait to see a doctor, remove it yourself. And if the mouth parts get left in, it's gonna be okay. Um, just try to avoid infection, like don't scratch and things like that, but it won't continue to transmit pathogens is what uh, I wanted to get across. And if you do encounter a tick, what you can do is you can send that tick to us. So I'm the project coordinator for NJ Ticks for Science and NJ Ticks for Science is a citizen science project that was launched in 2022 by Rutgers. Um, and so what we do is citizens of New Jersey um, encounter ticks and they can send them to us and we ID them and we test them for free. And then our whole goal of this is to provide results to submitters, but also to incorporate those results onto a tick map of New Jersey to show the prevalence of the different tick species and their infection status by county uh, in New Jersey. So how it works is you can go to our website, ticks.ruckers.edu, and what you would do is, this is what our homepage looks like, and you would click send us your ticks. Then you would click step one, fill out the form, then you'd fill out the form. This is an example form that I created and you'd attach some pictures. Uh, and this is helpful because we can ID a tick just through pictures if it's a good picture. So you can figure out what species of tick it was usually in 24 hours or less if you sent us a good picture. So remember, if you know the species of tick, you could figure out uh, what you could have been exposed to. So just knowing that is a really good piece of information that you could use to talk to your doctor or do more research of what tick-borne diseases uh, you could have been exposed to. So then after you submit your uh, form, you would get a tick ID number. And what you would do with that number is you would go back um, to our front page here and click track your progress. And when you click this, you can enter in your tick ID number and see um, the progress that your tick has made. So once we receive it, we'll check that it was received. Then we'll ID it again in person if we weren't able to make a clear ID through the photo. Uh, and then we will test it for pathogens once we have enough ticks uh, to do DNA extraction and then qPCR analysis. So. We identify, we extract the DNA, and then we perform qPCR. You track your progress. And this is an example of a tick uh, and that came back really hot, as we'd say, because it came back positive for uh, three different pathogens. So Borrelia burgdorferi, which is known as um, Lyme bacteria. Then it also came back positive for Anaplasma and Babesia. So 
this person, their comment that they left was that they were feeling pretty sick. And I, I believe them. It was a very engorged tick. They said it was attached to them. Uh, all of this is anonymous. So we know nothing about the submitter, uh, but. Their tick came back positive for these 3 things. So ticks can be co infected with multiple pathogens at the same time. Uh, so if you're getting tested for Lyme, getting tested for other tick borne diseases might be something you want to talk about with your doctor. And again, our whole goal is to put all of these results onto a tick map of New Jersey. So NJ ticks for science. Our main goals are for people to be able to identify ticks, not necessarily identify their species like how I was going through today. If you don't know how to identify their species, still don't worry about it. You can always send us a picture or send your tick to us and we'll do it uh, for free. And hopefully we can get you your uh, ID results in less than 24 hours. So we want people to be able to identify ticks in the sense that they know how big they are, um, that ticks can be smaller than a poppy seed, that they could be engorged and kind of like the size of a grape. Um, we want people to know that there's more than one species of tick here in New Jersey and that ticks, uh, there's more than just one tick-borne disease and that ticks in New Jersey um, are linked to these diseases. So it's more than just Lyme. We want people to feel confident being able to prevent tick bites themselves, wearing repellent, doing tick checks and wearing light colored clothing. And we want people to feel confident removing ticks themselves. Because like I said, a lot of the time people wait to go see a doctor. People have told me they've waited days to see a doctor, but time is of the essence when you have a tick bite because the longer it stays on, if it's carrying something, the more likely it is that it's going to pass it to you. So hopefully, from this talk, you have gained some tick confidence. You're better informed about ticks so that the next time you encounter one, you know what to do or you know who to ask. So hopefully this takes you from frantic worry uh, to enthusiastic adventurers. Um, and then just some final quiz questions if we have time, um, just some of the key take home messages. Uh, which tick-borne diseases are linked to black-legged deer ticks? So it's either A, none, B, Ehrlichia and red meat allergy, C, Lyme disease, babesiosis and anaplasmosis, or D, answers B and C. All right, so we got a lot of activity here in the polls. All right, and we got, it's kind of a mix this time. Most people got it right, but I do want to go through the answers real quick so that we know which one's right and for what reason. So the tick-borne diseases that are linked to black-legged deer ticks are Lyme, uh, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. So if you got bit by a tick and you tested positive for Lyme disease, um, the ticks that carry Lyme can also carry Babesia and Anaplasma. Not saying that they are, but they could be, like the tick that we saw um, in over here. This tick tested positive for three things. So this was a black-legged deer tick, and it can po test positive for multiple different pathogens. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind if you got bit by a, a black-legged deer tick and you tested positive for Lyme. So, here, uh, our final quiz question is nymphal ticks can be compared to blank in terms of size. All right, we got so many correct answers here in the chat. So the correct answer is poppy seeds. So nymphal ticks are about the same size as a poppy seed. And then adult ticks are about the same size as a sesame seed. And then uh, larval ticks, because they're smaller than nymphal ticks, they are even smaller than poppy seeds. So that is the end of our talk. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And Dean is also here as well. So there, it was an active discussion in uh, in the Q and A. Um, I couldn't I see anything. <laughs> you did your job very good. So um, it's really good. 
happy to learn a, a few things. Thank you. That was really good. Thank you. There were a couple of questions that I said, well, it may be easier to just talk about them, but um, um, Patty, um, Sue, if you, if you want to decide what you want to do next. Um, I, Patty, if you saw some questions, I was busy with the poll, which sort of worked, but didn't. So I, I really wasn't looking at the questions. You know, I think <laughs> it's great. Have, there yeah. was a lot of, a lot of questions about, um, you know, what kind of pesticides can be used and, you know, maybe addressing that because it seems like a big concern, not just in repellents on yourself, just kind of going over that again. So, so that I started kind of answering 1 of the questions because it's, it's a very good point. I mean, what, what Emily tried to do is, is talk about the sort of the habitat. Modification, you notice she didn't even really talk about it, uh, applying a carousides to the environment. And a few people are saying, well, you know, I, what, what do you think? What does Rutgers think of, um, of having people come and apply a carousides? And, and, um, we, we support integrated pest management. And so, um, the concept of just doing something by default is contrary to integrated pest management. So it's important to know. Do you actually have ticks in, in your backyard? If, if yes, it, it's always better to try to use a habitat modification. Like, for example, if you're, you have a beautiful garden, very green, you love the greenness, and then you have a forest right uh, abutting to it, try to create just a barrier. You don't necessarily have to like bold your, your, your backyard, like, uh, like uh, Emily showed the playground, just in areas where you, you know, you're going to have a lot of people activity, like around the playground. Try to use wood chips or or gravel or something to create a dry habitat because black legged ticks are very very susceptible to drying out more so than the, the lone star ticks. So lone star ticks are more um, dryness uh, uh, resistant, which is why they actually are relatively common. That was another question about uh, where do they occur. They actually are pretty common in the pine barrens, which is sandy and pretty dry and very much Ocean County. Um, so they're definitely quite common in, in Ocean County and they are tougher, tougher little cookies. But when we did that experiment that Emily showed about thinning the forest, which like Emily said, it's not about starting to chop down trees. It's about just creating spaces. It, this actually, the thinning was done because, um, it was in collaboration with, uh, uh, trying to prevent forest fires. So trying to just get rid of the underbush and sort of uh, removing some trees to allow light to come down. And what we found was that uh, we reduced the number of black legged, sorry, of um, lone star ticks by 80%, and all the black legged ticks were gone. So just that the, the measuring temperature and the higher temperature and lower humidity really makes a big difference. And then someone asked about, well, well, what about sort of we're getting conflicting messages? We're trying to promote pollinator habitats, you know, don't you know, no, no mo. Um, that's, uh, I mean, uh, we're actually creating a pollinator garden at, at Rutgers this, this summer, um, or this spring and summer, pretty excited about it. I'm teaching a course called insects and conservation, which is a little bit outside of my MO. I'm usually, you know, medical and veterinary entomology. Um, and so these kinds of questions, how can you balance? Um, the, the fact is that if you have a complex ecosystem where you have predators, like spiders, and and uh, uh, even crickets are are quite good predators of ticks. Um, that that creates the kind of environment where you're not going to have you know a gazillion of ticks. You're going to have a, a sort of a a, a more um, controlled environment. And then I guess finally, sort of connecting with what Emily says, don't be afraid to go outside. You know, ticks are not mosquitoes. Take four seconds to get a blood meal from you. It's bing bum done. Um, a tick will take several hours to even, you know, start kind of like, okay, this is a good site. And then it will take literally for, for Lyme bacteria, it will take 24 hours to even after it starts feeding to actually start transmitting the pathogen. So you got time, you know, the tick check is really the, it, it is possible that you want to have a beautiful habitat with lots of pollinators, you know, diverse environment, and you're going to pick up some ticks. You're going to go home calmly, look for them, Get rid of them before, remove them before they start biting, and all is good in the world. That's a complicated answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it will take. It will take really. Uh, you know, um, I'm sorry to say this, and I, I say this about mosquitoes too. It takes responsibility. We need to take responsibility from our backyards 
um, and not expect that these um, creatures that are critical for us to to function in the environment and to live on Earth are just going to like not be in our backyard just because we are there. So um, going to have to live with them. And and in terms of someone asked about repellents, um, peppermint oil. I have not found that it has a significant effect, neither on mosquitoes nor on ticks. Um, is it a repellent? I guess if you apply enough of it, yes. Um, but um, it, it has been promoted as a, as a way to sort of as an insecticide. We've not found that. We're actually working with catnip um, and uh, um, basil and working with, with uh, Dr. Jim Simon in the plant um, sciences department to try to find repellents that are nicer. I mean, I react to DEET, so I, I can't use DEET. I have to, to use other things. And Emily had a list of, of um, uh, picaridin and... Uh... Yeah, the one thing that's not listed on this is permethrin, and that's because permethrin is... that's We use it when we go and we drag and flag for ticks, um, and we get in our tick suits that are like these big white suits, kind of make us look like Ghostbusters a little bit. But when we before we go out we treat those suits in our socks and our shoes with uh permethrin and you have to like treat it i i forget if it's 24 or 48 hours in advance and you treat the clothes uh or like your bag or whatever it is uh and you don't put it on your skin and the reason is is because it'll hurt you um and also this is it's really toxic to cats uh so permethrin treated clothes if you have cats just be aware of that and so i kind of avoid putting it on educational materials and things like that because it's toxic to cats and also you have to be really careful applying it so it's a good tick repellent but just be careful using it and uh, uh, susan actually just asked the question i was just answer i was writing but i might as well say it so what if I live alone and cannot check my back or remove a tick from my back? Well, the the, the one of the things that Emily mentioned is tuck, you know, long sleeves. I, I know, I know it's not ideal, but um, tucking your 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 uh, pants in your socks, um, treating the clothes with with a, a, a permethrin or a repellent, um, those are the those are the possibilities. Um, sort of minimize contact. Yeah, and if I mean, if you live by yourself, maybe you can't necessarily like feel everything like your back, but you might be able to like get a mirror and look uh, behind you, like in the hand mirror and like look into a big mirror behind you. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. I'm not <laughs> wording this well. Um, like but a hairdresser. Maybe if, yeah, if you could like see it, if you see something off that you're like, oh, what's that little dot? Then maybe the next time you go to the doctor, or if you have a close friend or family member that you're visiting, say, hey, like, I need you to check this out. <laughs> Another thing that is, it's also, um, if you if you know that you're in an area or went to an area where uh, there are, and this is part of the reason we're doing this project, is try to create maps, as, as Emily mentioned, with sort of density and, and uh, distribution of different species, so that if, if you know that you went to an area where you might have been exposed, keep an eye out for the symptoms. I mean, even Lyme bacterium, if caught early, um, can, can, you basically can be given doxycycline and technically, um, it, it really is the long exposure that tends to lead to much more complex uh, consequences. So the sooner you start, um, but again, best thing, avoid tick bites. Um, I can't. Yeah. We have, we have two at Ocean County. Um, Patty can probably give a little bit more, but we do have a tick safety resource sheet that um, we have information from the University of Maine that talks about insect repellents. They rated them. Um, uh, they did a study on which ones are effective against ticks. Um, so we do have a, a link to that. It's actually still on our website too, but you guys could always email us um, and we can get that information to you. And then Patty, if you wanna just talk about what we do in the office. Um, yeah, so in Ocean County, we do tick identification. Um, so you are more than welcome to bring your ticks to us or send pictures um, and we can identify them for you. And 
what they're saying is absolutely true. Just knowing which tick you had on you gives you so much power as far as uh, the information that you can gain knowing what diseases they may carry. Um, so we can we can provide you with that and then you can go to your doctor and say, I was bit by a black legged tick or I was bit by a lone star tick and they can then further help you with what you need to do. Um, and what we're encouraging now is if you're gonna come to us um, and have your tick ID'd, then we're gonna give you uh, Emily and Dina's brochure and say, contact them and send the tick because everybody wants to get their ticks tested and a lot of people come to us thinking that we actually test the tick and we don't. Um, and they are offering it for free. So, you know, it's a service to you and it's like um, invaluable information for them. So it's a win-win for everybody, I think. Um, so definitely come to us, we can identify it for you. We're working with them uh, to get the ticks to them. Uh, and then I had one question I had is, um, what would be the turnaround time as far as um, getting results back from what the tick may have? So right now I've been doing, I was doing a couple months ago, uh, like once a week, uh, but we've gotten less ticks recently because it's winter. Um, not tick season is every season. Don't let that fool you. For sure. We're still out in the winter, but, uh, really it's just the black legged deer tick adults that are out, uh, questing in the late fall, uh, winter months. And we have been seeing like less of those. So we've only, I've been doing it every, uh, two weeks. I get the results out, but when we're getting more and more ticks, my goal is to do once a week. Uh, because it's just more cost effective right. when we have more ticks. Mm -hmm. So the fact is we are doing it for free. And so both Emily's time and the chemistry is much is a, it's an economy of scale. If she can extract, you know, 30 or 40 or, or 188, uh, which is kind of the max we do, um, it's much cheaper per tick okay. than if you're just doing three or four at a time. So um, I appreciate we we really would like to have this done. Um, it the turnaround of three to four days, um, but uh, it, in, especially during the, the the low season, which is kind of right now, um, it, she's probably, Emily's getting maybe like five or six a week or right. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're trying I to see. accumulate at least at least at least ten. Although you know she just wants to do them. Like Dina, I just <laughs> did three the other day. I'm like, what? <laughs> Well, because I feel bad because people will like waiting. email up and be like, right. where's my, and I'm like, I know you've been waiting. I need to get this to you, but right. you know, it stinks when it's not that many. Cause then I'm like, this is, we're kind of wasting money a little bit. Um, but it's for a good cause. Right. Uh, and w when you said before, it's like a win-win, it's like a win-win-win because win. we're getting the results. You guys are getting IDs and testing, but then also New Jersey as a whole, uh, we're getting this great tick map that will be a good resource, not only to just regular New Jerseyans, but healthcare professionals. Not a lot of people talk about uh, tick-borne disease other than just Lyme. And I would love for NJ Ticks for Science uh, and for like talks like this to spread the word about other tick-borne diseases and making it talked about more. So things like testing get better. Like, People just need to be talking about ticks and tick-borne disease more so that we can have um, better outcomes, patient outcomes, but also just uh, be more knowledgeable about ticks because there's still a lot of unknowns uh, out there. Yeah. I, I know we're over time, but I did have a question for you real quick for the male. Is it true that the male ticks don't feed? I thought they can feed, but they don't feed long enough to possibly pass on. It depends on, on the species. So okay. black-legged ticks, exodes don't, the males don't feed at all. Okay. Um, they they yeah. usually mate off host. And so the females are already mated, but all the other ones, all the, the you know, the emblyoma, the, the, the other different genera, um, the males will take small little blood meals. That's just, but that's usually not enough to really transmit. They can be infected. Don't don't get me wrong. We get infected males all the time because the nymphs were infected and and we'll get an adult infected. But they're much less likely to be transmitting because they just take small little blood meals while they're looking for the females to mate because they'll mate on host. So I yeah, yeah I was just questioning because it was we do get people that you can see they actually pulled 
the male the male yes cells. yes so i know yes. that they actually can in in some faces feed. yeah except the black legged tick the black yeah, legged tick the, the, those little stunted little mouth parts they don't <laughs> So interesting. Yeah. 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 And actually for some of them, Gulf Coast tick, for example, this new tick um, that was going to feature more prominently soon in our, in our program, um, it, the, the males actually hang around for, for a long time because they, they tend to just wait for the females will come and feed and they just wait on the host. Um, so they can often, they're the first ones to be found are, are the males. Um, they're, they're more often on, on a host. Um, but it, and I, I know we over time. Oh, no, you can one thing, another, okay. another thing that I think is really interesting in this analysis is that the New Jersey Department of Health is doing active tick surveillance in collaboration with mosquito control programs across the state of New Jersey, 21 counties. Um, and, but one of the, the interesting things about this New Jersey tick for science is that we'll get a, a view of what is what's actually being attached to people and, and the, their dogs. And we're actually also creating resources more linked to uh, our our companion animals, which also can get Lyme disease and and Ehrlichia and anaplasma. And actually, there's new pathogens, including associated with the um, dog tick, the American dog tick, that can be um, dangerous. Um, so when when Emily says, "Well, we're not really worried about American dog ticks," that's for people. Um, they are they are associated with uh, um, uh, Babesia canis in, in in New Jersey. So um, again, we had to make some choices about what are we testing, what are, you know how how what's the best way to maximize the funds we have, which aren't many, <laughs> to to maximize the, the the what we were providing as a service and also in terms of information for the tick map. Interesting. I it was a great. A uh, great talk. I I still didn't get a chance to see what's in the chat in the uh, Q and A, but so there was one one person that said that, that uh, she was not able to see the slides, and also were asking when would the 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 tape be available. Um, is yeah, I think you answered that actually, the, but um, the rec the, the recording. Um, we usually have that up. We put it on our website. Um, in a day or two. And then it do goes on the NJAES YouTube channel. Um, so what we'll do is we'll send an email to everyone who registered and they'll get the link. Um, and it's usually a couple of days by the end of the week. And, and by the way, Catherine has some great, a great question. She's asking, what is the significance of putting an animal species before the word dick? Well, actually, that's a great question because in general, so there's there's 13 14 species of ticks in new jersey and then we we did actually a survey where we actually ca caught animals like squirrels and groundhogs and and uh, raccoons and and all these animals and then collected the ticks they were carrying and believe it or not the raccoon tick is on raccoons and the squirrel tick is on squirrels and the rabbit tick is on rabbits actually rabbits have two rabbit yeah. ticks which is not informative. it's not a mistake it's it's it's, it's a thing. Yeah. It's actually a, well. It's why common names are problematic. These are very different ticks. Rabbit tick. Problematic. Yeah. This is. <laughs> thank you, Emily. Uh, this rabbit tick is an exodi tick, while this rabbit tick is actually Hemophazelus leporis palustris, which is a completely different genus, really different behavior. But they are on ticks. Um, so, um, so they are on, on on rabbits. I'm sorry. So, but but on the other hand, there are also like the 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 I believe is the woodchuck tick is actually found on a series of different um, animals so common names are a little tricky and then and finally i wanted to um, shout out completely agree with uh, um ruth miali that said um keep keep and keep note of when you were outside and uh, like all the information because timing is really important how long could you possibly have had a tick feeding on you and this is something that Emily and I've had enormous conversations about is that when we say 24 hours, it's actually very difficult to see an engorged stick that I've fed for 24 hours. They don't really look, they have blood in them, but it's really hard to tell if it's been 24 hours or five hours or 72 hours. Sometimes it's difficult, but that, those really big engorged things, those have been feeding for like a week. Um, so it really is important, uh, as Ruth mentioned, to keep keep 
keep track. Okay, I was outside at this time, and then I found a tick feeding on me three days later. Well, a, a, a visit to the doctor may be warranted at that point, and definitely send us the tick to, to have it checked. Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, some people have brought ticks in that are the size of a blueberry, like a big blueberry. It's, yeah. Yeah, we get yeah. those in the mail. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. <laughs> we do get Hopefully not mail. squished. Oh, yeah, squished. Oh, <laughs> Actually, yeah. It was, one of, it was yeah. a rite of passage for Emily who was having to deal with that, that one. Usually not smushed, but it wasn't, it was, it was a bag of many engorged ticks, all smushed. Yeah, it could get a little gnarly, I have to say. <laughs> Hopefully they weren't from us. <laughs> no, they weren't from you. They weren't from you guys. Um, but yeah, if we missed anybody's questions, uh, Patty and I will go through them um, and get, get some answers out to you if we were unable to answer your question online. So don't feel you've been slighted. We'll get to you. Yeah, we will get to you. Um, there's, just, there's a lot of questions, um, but we're over. We're about 15 minutes over. Um, yeah. But we will get to you and we'll send out the link and um, we'll send out um, a couple handouts that we have at the office. Um, and we look forward to working with you guys closely this season. Yes. I think we'll have a lot of ticks sent your way. Thank, thank you. you. And, and thank you all have... for coming and listening. Um, oh, really appreciate yeah. it. Yes, uh, I appreciate it too. And we have um, some new flyers that are going to be useful because it shows how you can use our website uh, and then you can actually use that same flyer to send in your tick so it has directions and i'm going to be sending those to you we just got new logos so i have to yeah. add those to everything and then we're gonna i'll send it to you guys and then get it printed yeah that, that would be awesome and one other thing that we're also considering is is re um and this we need to discuss with you patty and susan is is um these tick boxes at the county so we're going to be working more with, with county agent program. Uh, I'm sorry, um, RCE. So yeah. uh, what, what am I saying? Yes, am I you're missing? right. Okay. RCE. Yeah. RCE. And and potentially um, have then have the the um, just pick up the the ticks from the boxes. It may be. We'll, we'll, let's figure out how best to to integrate that with uh, the the New Jersey Ticks for Science. And also for any of you in, in the audience that is a farmer or has a farm. Um, we're also developing a program uh, because farmers really are often exposed to ticks and are not really often thinking about it. They're out there outdoors working, and so we're we're trying to do. And there really aren't that much research figuring out how much exposure farmers of different types of farming, uh, both animal farmers and and you know plant farmers um, mm -hmm. of different varieties, how much are they exposed to ticks, and what would be potentially they could do. As farmers to modify the habitat um, to 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 have to lessen their exposure um, to ticks. It's just a, 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 a the sort of questions that haven't really been asked. Okay. So we're trying to get there. That's excellent. Well, thank you. Why thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, yes, Patty. Thank you so much. This. Thank everyone for sticking with us. Um, we still have about 140 people with us. Wow, so, um, but yeah. Everyone have a great night and we will be in touch for sure. And thanks, Phyllis D. She was a silent partner on there. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis D. <laughs> and check out NJ Ticks for Science on our socials if you're interested. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and well, it's actually now X and Facebook. We're on like yeah, there's a great a great X of uh, of uh, Emily having could not find the tick. It's called Where's the Tick? Um and it's like a Grocho Marx um kind of kind oh, of cute. little clip. Um, so it's true. Uh, uh, the, it's it's a great story. <laughs> Take we'll care. Make bye bye. Sure we have. We'll make sure when we send it, we have all the links. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, 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 we will. Thank all you right. guys. Bye everyone. Thank you.